Head to the bone, that's a worry, isn't it? So thanks for having me today. How's everyone today? Hands up who wants to be a professional renovator. Good work. Hands up who thinks it's a little bit more than they thought it was going to be. Hands up, is this your first property seminar? Ooh, there we go. No, we don't dance, we don't hug, we don't sing. We just give you really good de content and detail. We've got a couple of I need helps going on in the room. What's going on over there? I haven't even started yet. Come on. So what we're doing today is we're talking about finance in a different way. Just so you think Cherie has gone through to the nth degree, I'm quite not like that, but we're going to go through what we believe you need to know to be a professional renovator. The catch call of my business is professional property is far more than just a loan. Please never think you could go to a normal and think about the loan first. There are many, many, many other things that you need to consider. We actually follow a strategy when we're talking with you, which we'll go through, which is on the card that may be in front of you. It's a different approach. And um, really, what it comes through is from experience of dealing with this business. Um, a bit about me, I come from a carpentry and joinery in a building background, working for Len Lease or Civil and Civic for 10 years. I've done 35 projects of my own. I came into the finance world because most of the brokers and bankers were crap. You get to a certain stage and you're, that's true. Hands up who's been there and say, I've got a couple of properties already and your broker or your bank teller looks really do dozy at you saying, How, well, I can't help you. What's going on here? There had to be a better way. So hands up who's experienced that. Beautiful. Well, you might have come to the right place. So in my time, I find renovation is one of the best ways to make money from property when it's done right. So I'm quite sure the content you're getting from Cherie, is everyone a bit blown away by that? Yeah. Hands up who needs any more templates and spreadsheets? <laughs> Cherie tonight will talk about what makes a good finance submission. I'm a bit of a guy who likes the abridged version. We can get all that information probably in a one-page summary and then about a 20-minute meeting, we can usually work out what is possible for you. So hands up who'd like to walk out of today knowing what's possible for them. Hands up who went to school. <laughs> hands up who did maths. And hands up who's willing to give it a go today so they know what's possible for them. Yay, well done, give yourselves a clap. So what we're going to go about today is professional renovation and finance for... Thank you. So... Typically when you do with our business, and we're based up at Nelson Bay by the way, I moved out of there about six years ago doing projects, and every time I come to Sydney or a capital city, a couple of days is enough. It's a beautiful part of the world. Our business runs out of there, we do a lot of stuff via Skype, via phone and via email, so don't think that's restrictive. And we also have a special exemption from the banks that we can talk to you without meeting you face to face, if that's okay with you. So some people think, oh, I live in Perth, or I live in Brisbane, or I live in Uckermunda West. It's okay, as long as you can get to the phone and we can work it out. Is everyone okay about that? So typically how it works is say, hi, I'd like to forward some information to you, and that's what's called a client snapshot, which is in your documentation there. It's that one-page document, and that gives me and my team enough to be able to work through, uh, do a bit of pre-work for four-hour meeting, then always call the office and make a time that suits for you. It can be business hours, it can be early morning, and sometimes we do them even late at night. It just all depends on how well your brain's going at 9.30 or 10 o'clock at night. So really from here, um, I do with the upfront strategies and things and the higher level questions, uh, but the team we will find, they do the delivery of that through loans, documentation, and making sure that all those fine print things are done. So really from here, there is a set process that we go through. We'll go through that in a couple of times. And one tip about the presentation tonight, if I say th things two, three, maybe four times, what do you think that means? Good. So there's a couple of keys you really need to get out of tonight and I'll keep reinforcing those. So it's not I am delusional, I'm just trying to make sure that you get this today and that you know what's possible for you. So then really there, we have our offering. Yes, we, are, we do far more than the loan. We, talk, we walk through a strategy with you to suit you. Our typical people we like to see is people have been somewhere before and they've said no. We like to take a fresh approach and have a look at that. I've only done fir or nine first home buyers in my life as a loan and that sort of help assistance. So we're about people with investment properties. 
The main aim is to make money out of your projects with cash flow, which funds an ever-increasing portfolio, which I think is the way that everyone in this room would think is the way to go. So it's a, it's a really good thing to do, but it needs to be done in a select way, and you need to plan ahead for the next two or three years now, so you know what's going to happen for you and what's possible for you moving forward. Is that all right for everyone? Yep. So really from there, meetings, as you said, um, after today, we have meetings for a couple of days at the Renovating for Profit office at Balmain. I'd love to sit down with you for half an hour or an hour, whatever works for you. But if that doesn't work for you this time from flights, business, children, partners, just let us know and we can always do that on phone and Skype. Face-to-face uh, -face meetings are good and I do fly to capital cities with the seminar program and also for the day. Uh, for example, I'll be in Melbourne later this month around the 25th, 26th of May. I'll be on the Gold Coast on the 30th of May. So if you ever want to meet face to face, which is the best way to really get a good feel, that is possible for you. Is that clear? So really from there, the whole aim of today is to get a whole strategy so that you make money out of your deals. Our number one thing that we do is ensure that you make money out of your deals. You can ring up with some questions about almost anything, can't you, Helen? Sure can. And we can always go through that. There's always the time for you. Cheers. One thing we ask is that you try and be nice and clear and ask ignorant questions, it's all okay. So really from here, this is how we work through this. The first thing we talk about and say, hey, how much money have you got? Or how much potential available fund is there for you? What properties do you have? What equity may be available? What do you think equity is available? Or do you have any other options for getting some funds? Is that JV partners? Is that vendor finance arrangements? Is that syndicates? What is that for you? And in some cases, what we're doing a lot lately for the few of the younger people is using parents' properties as equity to tie that in and try and make that work for you. But we also try and make sure we explain to the parents or any other people what's involved how to make that happen and answer all their questions because then they're a lot better with dealing with you. The next thing we talk about is what Darren went through. Everyone remember Darren from Bell yesterday? Talks about companies and trusts personal name, company name, is that going to be your principal place of residence? What structure are you going to use or entity for that particular property? The next thing we talk about is your strategy. What's your plan? Think about the plan that Cherie will be working with you over this course of this weekend. Is that two projects a year? Is the first year going to be two cosmetics? Are you moving into structural projects? What sort of buy price might that be for you in the areas you're thinking about? Those sorts of things are really important because the way we need to put these strategies together is for you. We need to be able to go into the story with the lender now. That's going to be the same story in two years' time. Lending is a bit tougher at the moment, and that's no bull, and I will not lie to you, but a good story always gets through. That's the point. Did you get that one? Yep. So it's all... The next thing we like to think about, we have a lot of clients anywhere between 1 and 92 properties. The average people sort of have somewhere between 10 and 12 on the hold, plus they do a couple of projects a year. There's one thing that a couple of our boys learnt um, going to GFC. You need to have personal considerations in your strategy. The typical family in Australia is going backwards $1 to $200 a week. Is that true? Yes. We need to allow for that without getting you squeezed. If you've got any existing property, we need to allow money to short fund that shortfall for a set period of time, usually 12 months. So that you know for 12 months all that existing property and existing commitments you have is taken care of. The last thing we do is a thing called sleep at night money. Who's a worrier? Who lies in bed at night looking at the ceiling? Who wished their partner would shut up so he could go to sleep? <laughs> yes. So that's the third allowance we have in place to make sure that you maintain emotional stability throughout the process. Yes, I've been there. I've woken up at 2 o'clock in the morning like this, staring at the ceiling. It's not a nice feeling. It's money and the pressure of the project does play things with your mind. Hands up who can relate to that? Yes. So these three things are very important in a strategy. Notice how we haven't even got anywhere near a loan yet. Isn't this amazing? So there's all these things. So for me, you have to have that buffer. So if you knew going forward that you were going to buy and renovate properties and sell them and make money, but you knew you could keep your family alive and food on the table, you knew you could keep your existing properties without doing anything for 12 months, and you had 10, 20, 30, 40 grand tucked away, does that give you any excuse not to do this? 
So it can really cater for lots of things. It can say with the name stage, oh, it's too risky. No, it's not. I've got all these things in place. You follow that due diligence system that Cherie's put in front of you and you have those buffers in place, you will win every time. You're starting to understand that, aren't you? I like the smiles on that. The next thing we do after, after with you is, what's the deal you're doing? Is that, a, is that buying for 550 spending 50 or 55 on a renovation and, and selling that out the other end just over 7 750 What is that deal for you? We need to then work through what you need to know, what you know, what you don't, not you know you don't know, all those sorts of things, all those little questions to make sure that you're armed and not armed and dangerous. So when you're going out looking at properties, you know what's possible, you've got some, a loan approval in place and your negotiating is a lot better when you're prepared within yourself with a loan approval waving and under the nose of Mr Real Estate Agent. Statistics will show that 55% of offer and acceptances in the year 2009-010 fell over because of finance. So that means you, you could get the best deal that you've negotiated but you couldn't get your finance over the line. That's disappointing. And really think about that from a real estate agent and a vendor's point of view. If you're trying to get 30, 40, 50, think about negotiating tactics, waving a loan pre-approval under their nose with those sort of statistics, you're in the box seat. If you can also sign a cheque and put that with it, how much power does that have really for you? So you've worked through all these things. You've talked to Darren and get your structure ready. You know what's possible. You've done your due diligence. You've got, you know what you're doing for the next few years. We've got all these buffers in place. We're talking about your deal. And then what happens, we go, oh, let's talk about finance now. Yay, that's good. But all these things have to come first because if you can tell me all those things, within 10 minutes we can go, okay, this is what's possible for you. So everyone, when, you, when we like to work with people, come in armed like that. Does that sound fair and reasonable? Think about what you've... It's only using what you've learned over this weekend, but it's taking you up to that next level. Operate from that next level. That's what's required to make sure that you make money out of all your deals. There's a, a, another presenter who sent an email out during the week that 10% of people only master one way in property and they make money every time on their deals. The other 20% sort of break even, but a high percentage, 60 70% don't make money out of their deals every time. And the reason is them... It's no one else. So get that, use this information and work through the process. So people say, well, okay, how long does it take to work with you? It's Thursday and there's an auction on Saturday and I need my loan approval. What's the answer? Thank you. We did get a lot of formal approval in three days this week though. It was amazing for someone in Perth. But what we try and do here is pitch straight down the line for you, getting realistic on time. If you know there's an auction in two weeks, we could do it. Three weeks, we're always sweet. But if you give us sort of five to seven days to get there, it's a push, but you will be risking that because we don't believe you can go with solid comfort to go to that auction and sign on the line. Is that fair and reasonable? So what we talk about is the intro is about 48 hours. A meeting somewhere between 24 and 72 hours from that point in time. And a lot of that's got to do with working in with your schedule because we can be flexible with that. Typically from that meeting, we've got some homework, you've got some homework and there's other things to get in place. So that usually takes probably two or three days, we're saying on the, if you're going down the middle. Then what we do is we meet in the middle again and say, oh, I've done my homework, here's what our story was, we've done our homework, so we call that confirm and what's going on. So this is the time where you get all your questions out, you make sure you understand what's going on and you go, okay, I'm on for this and I'm going to get into this and I'm ready to go. Is that fair enough? So again, it's not something we can, you can have one meeting, but realistically dealing with people and the amount of information that's required, you might need to talk about it, go then go and talk to your partner about it at night. Or you might go into an area and think, oh, well, I, instead of a 550 pre-approval, I need a 575, I'm having a few dramas, finding some good deals in there. Or you might actually say, hey, I thought I was going to buy a place for 575 and I'm finding 530 if I really push at the moment. What, what, other, what other possibilities are there? It needed a little bit more renovation in that particular street. See the things that we're talking about? That confirm reading really allows all your learning to come together into one spot. You'd be surprised at the statistics that my brain remembers about different areas. So we can talk about anything in probably any suburb in Brisbane, Sydney, Melbourne and Perth. Statistic wise, what deals work there, which streets might work, that sort of thing. 
The only reason I've got there is because we've been doing this a long time and we have people on the ground in all those sorts of areas. So we, I might be having a five meetings with people from Melbourne each week and they might be down at Frankston and we start talking about schools and houses. We might have people who are in the eastern suburbs of Sydney talking about Tamarama and Bronte. We talk about all these different areas. We might be talking to people who live up in Newcastle, for example, down in Wollongong. All these different things. It's having someone there who understands what you're going through and can help you put that together. So the basics of finance, because that's what we're here for today as well, is there's a couple of terms here. If you have an existing loan with a bank and you need to change that to another bank, that's called a refinance. Is everyone right with that? A CRAA is your credit file. This is a central agency which records all your credit inquiries for your life. And it will, the lenders will always refer to this document for ever and a day. So any little glitches from little phone bills to electricity companies to Telstra ripped you off 200 bucks and you told them to jam it so you didn't want to pay it, all come up on this little report. So one of the first things we like to say is, and your number one thing is, get your CRA report. Even if you don't think you've had any inquiries, just have a look. Get interested, get to know about what's said about you in the central agency out there. Is everyone right with what CRAA means? So uh, www.mycreditfile.com.au. Lender's mortgage insurance. Lender's mortgage insurance protects the lender, not you. If you default on your loan and in the worst case you don't pay that and the lender sells that and, and the lender makes a loss, they have insurance against that. Mortgage insurance is very expensive, but sometimes mortgage insurance is really necessary to make sure you get into the deal. I have a saying that, would you pay a couple of percent in mortgage insurance to be able to do the deal or would you not do the deal? Thank you. But it is a necessary evil. There are some ways sometimes in multiple property securities to reduce the LVR or percentage of how high the loan is and that can reduce your, your exposure to what the mortgage insurance might be. Again, we'll put it all on the table and see what's possible. Yes, uh, with low doc loans, and we'll get into a bit more later, the, there is mortgage insurance applicable to that, but you may or may not pay for that depending on the lender that you go to. So really for me, equity. Some people might say, hey, I've got a house worth $600,000. I've got a $200,000 mortgage. I've got $400,000 equity. Now that is true, but there's only a certain percentage that a lender will give you out of that property. That may be 60%. That may be 80%. It may be 90%. But for me, the equity that we like to talk about is the equity that can be made available for you. So really, there's a battle that wages on. For me, I've been doing this myself 20 years and uh, as, a, as a businessman for eight or nine years, I've only ever done one principal interest loan. It just didn't work. It works for the banks. They tie you into the same payment every time. Wouldn't you like the flexibility to be able to pay more off and reduce your interest? If you, had, if you had a project on and you need to move some funds elsewhere for a couple of weeks or a month, wouldn't that be nice to do that? Interest only gives you most flexibility that you can get in a loan. And that's my opinion. You're welcome to your own. A debt service ratio. The banks will say, OK, John and Jenny, they earn $100,000 a year combined. One bank will say to them, OK, from our calculations, we can lend this person $450,000. Another bank may say, hey, we'll lend them $470,000. Hey, and the other bank C might say, hey, we'll lend them $435,000. The difference in that is the debt service ratio that the banks will allow. It's somewhere between the range of 30% to 35% of your gross income. And that's just one of those um, terms, and the, the banks will call that the DSR. Does everyone get the gist about what that's about? It's about how much money they'll lend you from your particular scenario. The, the ASIC's come down with some new rules this year and they're really stringent on, more than ever about being clear that you can't spend more than 35% of your gross income on paying mortgages and banks and things, because, uh, lenders and different loans, whether what that may be, because it is fine. Life's expensive, people. You don't want all your money to be sucked out playing loans and mortgages and things. But there is another way to do that without that being a cash drain, which we'll go into shortly. So just a couple more basics here. A loan to value ratio. If I had a property worth $100,000 and my loan on that is $85,000, the LVR or the loan to value ratio of that would be 85%. 
If I had a property worth $100,000 with a loan of $60,000, the LVR on that would be 60%. Is everyone right with that? So variable versus fixed. Uh, we had a, a, vote, a, a competition last year about who fixed the loan and what was the biggest um, penalty or break fee to get out. We were sailing along well at 17,000, 18,000, 27,000. And I thought I had the winner at 32,000. And there was a one a guy that put his hand up seventy something, seventy four thousand dollars in break fees. Don't fix your loans, people. They've already put all the margin in all the loans. They're making more money off you. They're hedging that they they know whether uh, in the forecasting, are oh, the property's going to go up, are they going to go down? What they believe their actuaries are going to happen to interest rates. Fixed interest rates really restrict your capacity to do a deal that may come off on the side. Tie your money up, and even with your head not allow you to stretch and do the things that you need to do because as you evolve and grow you might have had that decision or that scarcity feeling that I need to fix that loan for a period of time to keep my head in place but when you have those three other buffers in place so yeah you can cater for that but still have the flexibility of keeping you uh, maintaining your emotional headspace because that's usually what the fixed rate does but it doesn't work for you as a professional renovator it works for the lenders a line of credit so people say, what's the difference in this? What we like to do in people's portfolios is have one loan somewhere which is a line of credit. It's basically a big credit card, so you'll have a certain amount that you can have and it's up to you how you spend that money. It may cost slightly more in interest rate, but they'll give you functionality like ATM access, uh, internet banking, all those sorts of things. But really from there, you only need one line of credit somewhere in your world. You may as well from there go and get what's called a term loan, which could be the same. And people say, but with term loans, can I still get an offset if it's an interest only? And I say, yes, you can. With a term loan, you're not paying for bells and whistles, but why would you for your deal? You don't want a loan that's a little bit more expensive when you're doing a project. You don't care if it, you can go to the ATM. You just want to get the cheapest money possible, and that's why a term loan is a basic, simple loan without any bells and whistles. Is that all right for everyone? Cash out. Cash out means the amount of money you can get made available to you when you're doing a refinance. Different lenders have different things that they'll say. You may have that property worth $600,000. You may have an existing loan of only $200,000. But there are some lenders there that if you went to do a refinance, they might only let you have $50,000 more available to you. There's some lenders that will say, give you $100,000 more available to you. There's some lenders that might only give you $10,000 more on cash out available to you. These sort of things are really important to know because they're a bit, their actuaries sit in their back huts all buzzing away on their risk profiles and they want to know that they're not going to give you the money and you're not going to go to the casino and blow it and buy cars and all these different things. We may not in this room, but many people out in the world have, so they think about these things. So when we're dealing with a lender down the line, we have to, we have to know, work through what we're talking about through here, through the structure, strategy, things. But cash out is one of the biggest things we'll look about when we're cho choosing lenders for your loan. Having the maximum amount of money available is paramount, and I'll say paramount, to you moving forward. We'll always recommend and work with you on a lender that will give you more money available to you. You can do whatever you like, but we will say, Go with the one that will lend you the most money and make the most amount of money available to you to then put into buffers and have available for you for your projects. Is that fair enough, everyone? It's just a smart way to do it. Oh, I love that. Thanks. I've got my first flag. Thanks. Portability is an, impo an important thing for people, especially doing short-term projects. We do our best to put renovating for profit students through mainstream. We do have some pri uh, private funding and no-doc funding available, but our aim, if you're not a full-doc customer, is to work with you moving forward, eventually we turn into a low-doc customer, and that's where the portability is a really important thing. Portability basically means, hi, I'm going to buy this property, I'm going to renovate this property, and now I'm finishing. Now, when you've finished, when you're selling that property, what the bank will do is they'll go, hey, are you going to close this loan or are you going to substitute another property in there to take that on? That transition there is called portability. Not all loans have that. Some lenders are really interested in that. They want those two transactions to settle on the one day at the one time in the one room. So twice the amount of solicitors in a room. 
So really, the portability... It's funny, isn't it? And then they all just stand there, pass everything around, and it's all over in five minutes anyway. But really, they have to have that portability on the one day at the one time, and that can be a bit painful. But there are some lenders that may say, hey, leave a thousand bucks with us in a term deposit. We can keep that loan open for three months. That's re some really important things to know. So portability is about how can I have the same loan but swap another property onto that as I'm keeping my role of projects going. Is that right for everyone? Yeah, another one. Yeah, it's the same guy. Come on. Funds to complete. One of the things we'll talk about in any type of property do you you're dealing with, we'll always make sure you have the funds to complete the purchase. That means you've got purchase costs. That means you've got loan equity. That means you've got some reno money. It means you've got some hold money. And it means you've got some buffer money like we'll put through the strategy. Having the funds to complete make this happen for you. There's no use embarking on a project if you don't have all the funds you need to make sure you're going to get through to the end of that project. The last thing you need and your family needs is you going losing your marbles because you've got 80% through that project and you've run out of money. Don't do it to yourself. Make sure you've always got your funds to complete. Typical fees with loans. There's sometimes a loan establishment fee. People, no matter what marketing these lenders give to you, there's always these fees somewhere in your loan. It's a bit like Mr Swan at the moment trying to cancel all the, the exit fees and break fees or DEFs, all the lenders are going to do is put it around to the front or put it through the middle. It's just always going to be there. It's just you might, often the marketing spiel is not what it seems. So these fees are there. There's a valuation fee usually in there. There's sometimes a mortgage broker's fee. The banks seriously don't pay us as much money at the moment as they used to. They cut the commissions by a third and now the loans are two to three times harder to put through, especially some of the creative ones. So sometimes people might charge a fee for that. Uh, a lender's legal fee, they will always have lenders uh, will have their own solicitors either in-house or third-party establishments and they always have a two or three hundred dollar fee some in there somewhere. There's a lender lender settlement fee. What they do people is assume there's somewhere between six hundred six hundred and a thousand dollars to get into a loan and get out of a loan. That's that's the sort of gross. However they hide that you know, or any specials there may be are great but if you assume that all those things are, are like that. And then it's like any good institution like a bank and that's why they make billions and billions of dollars worth of profit. There's fine print everywhere and you understanding the fine print about this $200 here and $175 here and $450 here and blah, 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 just make sure you're clear on that because can really, we need to work out your way forward. So one of the big things, um, especially with some of the low doc lending that we may be offering you is to look at the exit fees and make sure you put them into your feasibility. Sometimes they can be up to sort of 1.25%. 1, 1 and you might say, well, I'm not going to do that. But we go, well, okay, do you pay 1 to 1.25% 1 and do the deal or do you not do the deal? You're going to be paying cheaper interest rate than if you went to development funding by probably 2 maybe 3%. You won't have a 2% application fee or a 3% application fee. Take a bit of a wood for the trees approach with this, but make sure you know about your exit and, and discharge fees, especially on your projects. Is everyone right with this? Anyone got any questions? Oh, this is going well, thanks. You do know it's my 40th birthday tomorrow. Yay! So thanks, you've been ever so attentive. So what we do is we say, okay, what do the lenders look at? So you've got to throw a bit of personality in there. They look at your CRA report and say, good for you to have a look at that, even if you haven't done it before. They can post it to you for free or it costs you 25 bucks. You're in the professional property game, guys. Not knowing a CRA's cardinal sin number one. Just have a look at it, learn a little bit more. I'm sure Cherie's talked about that. No short-term loan. So a lender typically does not want to see you as a short-term proposition. And that's why we talk about so going through the mainstream is a cheaper way and there are some fees associated if you're going to use that loan short-term but any fees associated with that are far less than it will be you getting project or development funding. But they really don't want you. So we profile you as buying an investment property to renovate and to hold. And uh, if you choose to sell that in a shorter period of time than 25 to 30 years, that's your business. Did you understand that? Cash out for refinances. We focused on that before. It is a really big thing for them at the moment. 
We had a one low doc funding line earlier this year, but the cash out was no good. We've had to, we're always moving lenders. Our specialist is really finding those, those uh, lenders that require the minimum amount of documentation to get your deals through and with the cash out we need. Lenders will be really fussy about the DSR or the serviceability. They'll be really strict on that, especially on full doc. Uh, there are ways and means, but that is one of the things that they are big on because ASIC's big on that at the moment. They're saying it's all about responsible lending, making sure you won't fall over, uh, all those sorts of things. And that all comes down to serviceability and them being comfortable that you will be able to make those repayments on the loan. The, it's funny at the moment, even buying investment properties, they, want, they always ask us, what's their exit strategy? Is that buy and hold and rent? Are they going to sell that? Uh, what's their plan? It's, it's really funny. Sometimes I ask that for the most basic buy and hold property, and you just, but they always want to know what's their exit strategy. They also, this is very important for them, hands up here who's over the age of 58, they ask. They say, what's this person's, because essentially you're meant to retire at 65, and they think that you fall off the face of the earth and don't make any money anymore, but you do. So whenever someone's over the age of sort of 57, 58, we have to tell the lender what is their exit strategy. Have they got any super? Have, what, what other things do they have? Do they have any shares? What other things do they have? And then and one of our exit strategies might be, hey, just give us a 15-year loan. That's okay. But So what we do is we tell them what we like to do for the exit strategy up front. One big thing at the moment in lending is documentation. It'll drive you a bit crazy, people. I'm not going to lie to you. You'll be going, I've got to get that one more rates notice to that guy. Come on, I've got to do it. The council's mucked me around for a week or two here. Or you go into the bank and they still haven't posted you that statement that you're after. Documentation is the key. So you've really got to make sure your documentation's in order. Yes, mails, it's going to be chucked in your shoebox. It's going to be down, tucked down and fallen down somewhere. Spend about, allow about an hour, an hour and a half to get your documentation in order. It allows you to finish up your loose ends get your bits of taxation in, get all those sorts of things, keep that in order, people. It's a really big tip. We had one client who um, bought nine properties on the fly, bought, renovate, sold, nine in a row. And he said to me, hey, Paul, I want to do another one. And I said, I've been telling you since project number four that you need to clean up your loose ends. I said, I'm not going to write another loan for you until you clean up all your loose ends. He goes, yeah, mate, it'll only take me two weeks. I rang him in two weeks just to G him up. Here you go, mate. Finish your, finish your loose ends. Oh, no, no, no. Four months it took people. There's always a residue in this business in documentation. Make sure you stay on top of that. Not just in the finance game, but just generally. There's t documentation galore. So make sure if you're not organised, try and part with someone who's organised and vice versa. And also know your strengths within that business. So that's what lenders are really looking for is those things. Is everyone clear on what a lender's about? The days of having a pulse and getting a loan are not around anymore. You need to have a little bit more, you need to have a bit of heart. So really, again, we talked about that. So really what happens, the essential things to take away from lending, the banks are, happy, are worried about a few things. They want to make sure that the property or the security stays in order. They want to make sure that you can service that loan and you do. And they also want to make sure that out in the marketplace, the LVR of that particular arrangement with them is within their, within their range. An example is might be some properties in the eastern suburbs currently at the moment may have been listed for $2.8 million. They're now maybe selling and now be only worth $2.1, $2.2 million. Some of the lenders will get a bit nervous and they'll send those people letters. So that's a, it's important for those three things so the, the property's in good order, you keep servicing that loan and the valuation doesn't drop below the loan amount because that's the, that's the main three things that lenders look for. So you're going, oh, whoa, have had everybody stand up for a minute? Let's get a bit lively.
I had a question, do I still do with Rams? Rams used to be a real favourite um, channel of ours. We used to be top Rams, top third top rider in Australia. Then they decided not to go to the broker channel anymore. We've had to do a do with the franchise. I almost bought the franchise because they're really good on low dock loans, to be honest. Their rates are really good. Their documentation and cross checks aren't quite what some of the others are. And sometimes it's good to go there. So yeah, the, so some, a lot of the lenders, you will, you will know them by name, but just think about there's more than just going to them and saying, hey, I want a loan. There's all these different things that you need to get in place to make sure your store is there. Yes, Helen. Hi, Paul. Uh, just wondering, have you done a renovation project yourself? And it's, yes, I've done many? 35 in my time in the last 10 years. And I've only done one since GFC. I used to do three or four a year. So the reason I came into the money because I wanted to keep doing this and I kept hitting the wall. I had, I had somewhere between five and ten properties on the whole, right? And I walked to these people and I'd drop it on the table and they just look at you and they just go. And I said, oh, can you help me? And they just go, nah, no way. And one thing I like about, I went to every prep property seminar through 85, through probably 95 to 2000. The thing that used to annoy me the most was watching someone like Cherie present and do an awesome performance. And then there was no back end. There was no one that you could go to that could deliver what they talked about. Has anyone been to seminars and they got annoyed about that? Yeah, it used to really annoy me. And that's what our business is all about. So come and tell us your story and we'll show you how to deliver it. And if you can't deliver it now, we'll show you when you can deliver it, if that makes sense. Yes. If you're employed, you're saying they'll take 30 to 35% of the gross income. Yes. If you're self-employed, they're not going to do that. Yeah, they do. It's just how we tell your story to them to make them comfortable with that. Okay. And just to, if you can talk about super later too, using... Loans. You can use super as well. That's right. Okay. Categories of loans. Full dock loans. Everybody heard of a full dock loan? A low dock loan. Now, no matter who you are, you might earn $250,000 to $300,000 a year at the moment. Good on you. There will be a point in time if you get into professional renovation where you will need a low dock loan. Tip number one. Everyone write anything low dock loan. Not being funny. You'll know why in a moment. The main loan will work on people, especially after their second project will be low dock loans. The third type of funding is no dock loans. We are going to go into more details of these and there's some notes you can take. Anyway, I'll give you a bit of an overview. No dock loans pretty means they need much at all. Uh, am I going all right? Yeah. Just had a cut out, sorry. So what they will do is they'll usually rely on the property only as a security for that. They won't ask too many other questions, but they will charge you more money for that. The third type is private funding. I heard, read a thing the other day, there's $72 trillion around the world waiting in wealthy guys' bank accounts waiting to invest. Unbelievable, isn't it? These private guys, there's deals everywhere for them, but they're being really fussy at the moment. But a lot more private guys are getting into the money, the money market, especially in the uh, sort of between the no-doc, low-doc and private funding market. They're coming back in there because they need to make money on their money that they have. So those sorts of things, whilst there might be a lot of money waiting, it's starting to come through now because they've had a, a couple of years where it's been a bit tight. So what we do here is full-doc loans. A definition of a full dock loan, it it's only comes down to the income documentation that you require for the lender. So if you're working in a job, that might be two computer generated pay slips, a letter from your employer, and maybe your last year's group certificate or tax assessment. If you're a self-employed person, they'll ask for the last two years business and personal tax returns. And then they will take an average of those two, plus a few other things to tell you how much money they believe they'll lend you. There's usually only the lender and the mortgage insurer involved, and the mortgage insurer is only involved with a loan LVR of over 80%. So the key point is really the income documentation. Now with this, and there's a bit of a summary we'll come up with later about the loan profiles, but that's more of your, if you thought that was you, that's the main things. The thing to think about there is a lot of the lenders and the mortgage managers in particular will be, be a bit more lenient if they don't have to go to the mortgage insurer. So they may make a bit more of a commercial decision about your loan and that's the decision making on that. But if it has to go to the mortgage insurer, they'll always follow it, dot your I, cross your T and that's it, you fit in a box. Everyone right with low, high, full dock loans? Yep. Low dock loans pretty much mean you have to have a, a low amount of documentation. They won't ask you for your last two years tax returns. They may not ask you for some pay slips. There's a couple of things that are really important there. Um, they do have the lender and the mortgage insurer involved in that, 
but um, often the criteria for those sorts of loans is a bit uh, uh, less fussy for want of a term, but they will lend you less money in a low dock environment typically. Um, tip under low dock loan where you wrote before, one of the big important things for you as a professional renovator moving forward is you have an ABN with GST registration for a period of more than two years if you would like a low dock loan. So one thing, even if you knew this was going to be your business into the future, wouldn't you be planning for the medium and longer term now? So one of the tips is people get an ABN with GST registration somewhere in your world, whether that's a company, a company in trust or in your personal name. If you would like to talk more about that later, I'm more than happy to do that. That is a real key and I'll say it a few times today for, for you moving forward as a professional re renovator into the future. So the loan profiles, we'll go through that a little bit more before, but let's keep, you, uh, keep your mind going. Yes, Helen. Um, where it says, you said for about ABN and GST registered, yes. is it a particular um, company or can it be? No, it just, uh, you could be the director of that particular company or that could be in your personal name. And there, as, a, as a business person, even if you didn't have one today, moving forward is paramount for you to do so. So talk to Darren, work through your structure and what you might, is that what's your operating company, what's your company in trust of a hold or even in your personal name. It's really important that you get that somewhere in your world that you're personally associated with. Yes. Um, what if you have an ACN? Is that similar to an ACN? Well, really, if you're operating a business, uh, one of the things, if you have an ACN, typically you would need to have at least the ABN registration there. Uh, and if you have that scenario, come and talk to me later because we can work with that. What we try and do is talk to you how it works in mainstream low dock at the moment. And if you have an ABN and GST registration for a period of more than two years and uh, you're willing to sign a declaration to support that, that amount of lending, that, can be a that may be a reality for you. So that's, there's only certain criteria that the, that the lenders will look for in you substantiating the income for them in the story to give them comfort that they'll give you the loan. Okay, no doc loans. Basically, you wouldn't need to supply any documentation whatsoever. Is that a low doc question? No, yeah, ABN okay. question. Yes, an ABN question. I've got an ABN with a partnership. Yes. If I change over to a company in this, do I need to produce another No, we ABN? probably, we, for the bank's purposes, they would look at the partnership because one would assume the partnership's been around for longer and that somewhere in your world, whether it's in a partnership, your personal name or a company or a company in trust somewhere, that's where they'll be looking for an ABN somewhere. Now, no doc loans, again, most of you guys, it is available to you. Sometimes you may have the stage where you, your exposure with some of the mainstream lenders may be higher, which means you've got a lot of loans. You may need to go to uh, no doc lending. Again, basically they take the property as a security and they lend accordingly to that. If you look at through some of the profiles, you see how with full doc loans they'll lend you a lot, with low doc loans they'll lend you a little bit less, and with no doc loans they'll lend you a little bit less even more. As the risk profile increases for them, uh, hence the loan amount usually comes down and the rates and, and interest goes up, if that makes sense. So private funding loans are very uh, typical, uh, so they're coming back out in the market. And often this could be a, a private funding arrangement through myself or through someone that I know, but it could also be someone through some of your family and those sorts of things. And, uh, and there are people that, that, are, that can put that together with you. So is everyone right, all right on the four different types? So there's a full doc, a low doc, a no doc, and a private funder. Is everyone right with that? Everyone got a good rounding? Any specific questions on that? Okay, so here's this summary we talked about. And what I'll do is I'll say, okay, a client might say, hey, I'm a self-employed person, so hence I'm going to be a low doc. Uh, I've got a property at the moment, and what can I get out on my refinance? And I'm going to say, oh, okay, somewhere between 60 and 80%, it will be available to you. So again, if your property is worth $100,000 and your current loan is $20,000, the loan that you may get is somewhere between sixty and eighty thousand dollars, and that's what this is basically trying to say to you. So, don't worry, people. We are going to work through this. Remember, I said if you went to school, so if you yawns. We've got to spark you up a bit. What you're going to do is, I'm trying to load this information into you. You might be thinking, where's this guy going? But then all of a sudden, we're going to do an exercise shortly where you'll go, oh wow, 
This is, this is what he was talking about before. And that's when we're going to keep loading from here. So don't worry, that will just be a bit of a re reference for you moving forward. Because if I'm talking to you on the phone, I'd say, hey, oh, you're a LODOC customer. We're going to go to this particular lender. The refinance is, is we're going here at 60% because the cash out policy. Or you can at least have the information there in front of you. So we come to a stage where everyone goes, what sort of things do you do? And what sort of things don't you do? So one of the things that is really important is think about it as a strategy. Have you noticed today we haven't really talked much about loan things? It's about all the things around the outside. So going, going straight in for the loan, what loan, what loan, what loan, is not really going to help you as a strategy moving forward. So really from there, the documentation we talked about. Have that loan pre-approval in place is very important. We have had a couple of people who took the risk per se of um, getting into an exchanging or going to an unconditional contract without finance. Um, this business is stressful enough as it is. Um, putting yourself on the line like that, whilst it might seem the best deal in the world, may or may not be the smartest idea. I'd usually lean on the may not be the smartest idea. Um, so have a, th have a think about that. So having the pre-approval in place is really important. Get those buffers in place. They'll make, they'll, especially if you're doing this without your partner, I'm sure your partner's wondering what cult you're going to come home from this weekend. I'm quite sure about that. And you're going to say, hey, dear, I'm going to go and buy a property for a million dollars and renovate them. They're going to go, what? They're going, and he learned something on the weekend. You go, yes, but I've learned all these things. I've got a due diligence system to follow. I've got all these things in order. And hey, dear, I've got three lines of buffers in place. Do you know, dear, how it always costs us more to live each week? You go, yes. Well, we've allowed for that. Do you know how we've got a, another property already and you're, we're always thinking, where's the money going to come from for that? We've allowed for that as well. And do you know, dear, how sometimes you lie in bed at night um, going, looking at the ceiling? And you go, yes, dear. You go, well, I've allowed for that as well. Isn't that smart? Come on, people. Like, really? Isn't that smart to have those in place? Yay, that's really important. Hey, this business is really interesting. It will do your head in and running the subbies is, is, and finding the deals is, is one thing. Running the subbies is another thing. Having money squeeze and money worries is another thing. You've got to try and minimise the amount of things that your brain has potential to spin out about. And that's really important for there. So that's, see, I've talked about the buffers now about five times because I've been there and I'm not a really worrier and I've, got, I've had a couple of times, it just wasn't fun. So really, we talked about the ABN and GST rego. That's a really important point. That should be probably your number one or your number two. A consistent story. Some people say to me, come and have a meeting, we talk about something, and they don't tell me about this credit card, or they don't tell me about that property, or they don't say I had a problem with a phone bill a couple of years. Am I still here? And I go, come on, my deal with you is please tell us the whole story, because there's usually a solution to your problem. The last thing we need is to go down one way thinking we're going one way and then you give us one or two bits of information we were meant to know before. It can totally change all that, the way that we're going. So just be open and honest. So if, you, if you've previously had challenges and you had to declare, just let us know. There are lenders that out there that can do with just people in that position. Uh, so just keep telling us the truth the whole time. Often people, um, they'll think, oh, it was only $100 and it was an electrical company seven or eight years ago and all those things. Just know about that and, th and those sorts of things. Get the, cons the story consistent and the whole story. And even on a positive note, tell us your story. What's your plan for the next one or two years? Maybe three years. What is it? Again, are you doing cosmetic renovations to start? Do you want to slide a hold in there somewhere? Um, do you, when do you want to step up to structurals and what might that look for you? Because the story we put in now to the lender needs to remain consistent for two to three years to go in with your strategy. So every time you go in for money, the story is the same. So you're not going in saying, hi, my name's Paul, this is my story. Then six months later, you, I want to get another property. Hey, this is Paul, this is my story now. Those actuaries in the back room won't cope with that. They're worrisome as enough as it is. Um, so we need to make sure that your story's straight. So we need to know your past. We sort of know where you are in the present, especially working through this system and working into the future. So that's really important on a do. Um, again, the whole process takes a while. We'll go through it in a bit more detail later. It's about a 30 touch point process dealing with our business. Yes, we love you and I know you love us, but it gets a bit frustrating somewhere within that 30. For some people it's up front, for some people it's at the end, for some people it's in the middle, it's just real. 
and there's always a time where you'll, we'll, we'll be pushing and pushing and pushing. It's just one of those things. Just get used to things taking time. Don't think that we've submitted the loan today. We're going to have a formal approval in two or three days. It just doesn't happen that way. So we say to people, let's just be real on time. The last thing to think about is be aware of all the people in the equation. You might have to have an intimate understanding of what a mortgage insurer does or what a credit person at the bank does, but just know that they're there so that, and then appreciate that our submissions have to make these people comfortable with what you're doing so they tick the box, tick the box, tick the box. That's all they're, import, they're, they're charged up with is getting through so many loans an hour. So what we have to do is appreciate what each person's role in the equation is and treat them nicely, help them out a little bit because that often makes this and streamlines the process and you get a better outcome. So they're the must-dos. To concentrate on the don'ts for that, don't focus on interest rate and fees. If a bank will give you an extra forty dollars or $50,000 on a refinance on a cash out, take it. Don't worry about 0.2 of an interest rate. Now, I know there's some cultures that are in this room that will chase rate all day long. There will be a point in time where you'll see the light. It might be okay for a little while, but if, if the difference between you getting that next deal and not is having 0.2 or even 0.5 of an interest rate higher, I know I'd take the deal. Who would? Absolutely. That's so really important, that. Yes, we try and get you the cheapest loan available at the particular time, but interest rates shouldn't be your number one focus. It's a bit like the whole property thing again. The loans is not the whole focus. There's all these other considerations to take into, it, to take into account, and it's the same with interest rate. Uh, never cross collateralise uh, properties. I see cross collateralisation is like a ball of wool. Hi, Mr. Bank, I'd like to buy a property. Let's wind it this way. Next, uh, six months later, hey, Mr. Bank, I'd like to buy another property. Well, let's suck a little bit out of that one. Let's get it and let's wind it around this way. Hey, uh, Mr. Bank, I'd like to get a line of credit to get a new car. Is that okay? Oh, we'll take a little bit out of this one and a little bit out of this one. And hey, let's wind it this way. What happens is you have a really crazy mixed up ball of wool. The person in the bank that put that together would have got promoted and moved on. No one would have documented that properly. And it's an absolute mess. Now, if you want to move away or move forward, what the banks want to try and do is they want to keep their grip, grubby little claws into you. So what they do is the cross-collateralisation is one of their main ways. There are many people, if you're with NAB, Westpac or CBA at the moment, there's, and you've got more than two loans there, they're cross-collateralised people. They just have not told you. So we even had a lady, it's a story I tell, um, in the first year in Adelaide, she... Um, she basically took her five months to get the information out of the lender of how her properties were crossed together. That's a disgrace, people. Why don't they know where you're... How disrespectful to not know where your money's doing and how your properties are crossed together. They, all they want to do is get four points of contact with you, whether that's loans crossed, a credit card and a savings account, and they want their little mitts into you, and that's one of the ways. The hardest part about moving forward sometimes is getting one of those properties out of there to get you some equity to get you into the next deal. And that's what they're trying to... They're trying to control your world in that way. Is everyone right on what cross-collateralisation is? Does anyone need any questions on that? Yeah, see, sometimes what happens is you have to have to walk the lot because they'll make it so hard, they'll muck you around and muck you around and not tell you and they'll... What they do is... Westpac's famous for this, is they'll get you down to, they'll say yes verbally and to the next purchase and they'll get you down to you've got no time left, you can't go anywhere else and then they tie another one in on the top of it. It happened to a footballer who's for a renovating for profit graduate last month. Yeah, it's no good. So really, no fixed rate loans, we talked about it before. We talked about no, don't exchange on a contract without formal approval and just see if the pre-approval as a real negotiating tool for when you're negotiating your property. Yes? He's, he's there. There? Yep. yep. Um, well, you just said then if, and I'm guilty of having cross-collateralised properties, um, you said there you may have to walk the lot. You yep. mean... Get out of them? Yeah, so what you do is you have to say, say how, many do you have, how, how many do you have across? Just pick a number. Two. I've got um, five, but I've only got two. Oh, ones so let's go, the, let's, let's go to the example they had all five crossed together. That would be a really, really tangled ball of wool. So often what you would have to do is go, okay, all five, let's step them out here. Let's go 
couple here, couple here, and one over there, all different lenders. So there's no way they could tie you up tight that way. Oh, you're going to get me. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you, Paul. Happy birthday to you. Hooray! 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 Thank you. Everybody have a piece of cake. <laughs> It'll make you lots of money. You can have cake for profit, couldn't you? That's a worry. Thanks, everyone. Birthdays are an interesting thing, aren't they? Just joking. We talked about don'ts of finance. You have to sing happy birthday. Come on. <laughs> I have a question. Yes. Um, I'm one of the puns that's got, like, I've got 10 that are all cross collateralised. Um, and I tried to get out by getting another a loan. Mm -hmm. And there was just no way they would let any of the properties go. Mm. So where do I go? Well, you, do you live in Brisbane? I live in Adelaide. Ah, really? Mm. Did the valuations come off that much, did they? Because sure one of the main reasons they, some people get stuck there is the valuations have come back a bit. So then trying to get on to the next lender or not having someone who understands how to get the most amount of money out to, to, to be able to pay the first bank out in full, mm. that's the key is out of your 10 that you've got together, we have to get enough money to say goodbye bank, we're going somewhere else. Yep. And is that possible for you at the moment? I'm not sure how to put that together, I'm confused. <laughs> Good. Come and see me later, we can work that out. <laughs> Thank you. See, they don't want you to understand this, people. Do you understand what the system, how the system works? They really want to capture you. That money is a control mechanism. And the bank, that's how they do it. So we try and say, what you think about money and finance is actually not the reality of what's possible out there. I have to watch what I say sometimes, and I'll always talk to you one-on-one -on -one in a different way than we will up here. Sometimes I'll just stop when I'm up here and you'll know that i am said something that's meant to make sense to you. But it, this is possible for everyone in this room. The number one thing really is if you've got available funds somewhere, this can work for you. You may have to start on an apartment somewhere if that's your story, but this is possible for almost everyone in this room if they're willing to work with us and work within the system. Yes? Uh, Paul, how is the uh, cash out policy going? Like yeah, as I talked about before, different banks are sliding around a bit with that at the moment. But we've got, a, we've got a funder at the moment um, on a low doc. They'll get up to 60. Cash out is not a problem. Um, we cover that with other documentations and statements about what that money is going to be used for. That keeps their credit team happy so they can tick. Okay, that... so 60% is the highest. Uh, no, it's not, but it just depends on your particular situation. Okay. But okay. cash out on the low, a lot of, quite a few people we deal with through here, they're probably calling 55 plus. They may have minimal, if not unencumbered property. Um, to get money out of that to do this, go into a normal lender, they won't give enough money, they'll, own, they'll restrict the amount they can have. So we just work around the lenders that we can use for them. Okay, so there are other options. That's yep. correct. Okay, thank you. So we talked about getting frustrated. Don't, don't tell us the real story. Allow sufficient time frames. Notice how some of these things we've gone over again and again and again. Now, one thing to think about, think about Darren's talk. He's talking about company and trust entities. One of the things that they, I will ask, because the way we like to do the loans and knowing lenders at the moment, is and the entity that is going to own your property, please don't have developments, renovations or construction in the title. That's not the company that when you answer the Cherie says, hi, it's Cherie's Developments, can I order that timber please? That's not that company. This is the company or the company in trust that is going to buy the property. Darren knows about this, so when you work with Darren, it's all fine. But we just have to say one of the really important things about finance is don't have that in there because we're trying to sell them the story that that's a long-term hold and investment property for you. So having developments in the title, they'll can it straight away. And they'll put it through to their business banking section. They'll charge you an extra 2% application fees. They'll put the interest rate up about 8.5% uh, or even more. And they'll ask for more documentation. So it's a really important thing for yourself. Yes, you can have that company called Paul's Developments, but it can't be the, that can't be the entity or the 
think the, the structure that buys your properties for you. Is everyone right on that? Yep. I have a question. Um, when you say don't, don't tell us, you don't tell us the real story, yep. just, just to verify that, something I might have forgotten about, like a phone bill two years ago you said before, yep. that's what I find out on my credit file, mm -hmm. is that right? Yes. And then I can tell you. And that's why I'm saying to be professional from this point in time, and Cherie's big on this one, this is one of her main points with me, tell people to get a credit file up front, just so you know. Thank you. Because there are some people who genuinely don't know about some of the things. That um, the banks don't believe you if they then find out and you go, oh, sorry, I forgot to tell you. But if we then go, okay, they had a phone bill here. This is the story. We can show it was paid. Here's a letter saying it was paid out. Isn't that a better story to tell, to tell the lender on your way in? And then what we might say is we might not go to bank A, we might go to bank D because they might let the small defaults that's on your credit file through, whereas bank A and B won't do that. So it's again, it's about sharing the information. So we're trying to work out which lender can we go to in the end. Is that right? Yes. Um, one question in relation to LVR. I noticed yes. you've got 95% up there under personal name, sorry, on a previous table. Yes. You can borrow up to 95%. And then for a company or a trust, it's 90%. That's I'm just, correct. I'm just curious to understand as to why they only do 90 when you're providing a personal guarantee in those instances well, anyway. It's, it's funny with that because what happened, um, companies and trusts are a really good thing to slide responsibility around in your commitments. And a, and a, a few people through time, some of the big flies use company and trust to their advantage. And barristers used to be really big on this as well. They bow in company and trust entities, get all this money, drop and clear, and come out the other end all smelling like roses. So a few things that happen over time, they believe if it's in someone's personal name, they will fight for that more than if it's in a company and trust name. And that's how their actuaries sitting in the back office actually think about it. I personally don't agree because I think if anyone's going to be smart enough to use a company and trust entity to get to take that purchase on, that means they're a bit more savvy and they know what's going on. Whereas, but the banks actually live in a world of fear and scarcity and all these sorts of things. I, to, be, to, to be honest, I actually don't know the technical answer, but when I actually asked a question about that was it, because there's a few more loopholes that people can get through and they wanted to have enough buffer there to manage their position. So let's say that property sold 10%, 5% under market, they still knew that, that, you, that they had enough money to get through and get that sold and still get their money back. It was just a sign of the times. It was a, a, so people just milked that over time and then that was the outcome from that. A bit like a few, uh, a couple of apples spoil the whole box sort of thing. Did that answer that for you? Yeah. So, class exercise. Is everybody right? Yeah. Grab a pen. So this is the this is the exercise. This isn't done anywhere else that we're aware of at the moment in this scene. What our aim is from here is in a gross way for you to be able to work out what is possible for me. Now. After this first section, some people might get a little bit, oh, I can't do this, I don't have any money. There is ways through that, and Sheree has shared a few ways with you, and there's many ways within this manual, if you don't have available money, that you can get into this business and make it. It's like anything in life, it comes down to you. What are you willing to do? Having equity is an easier way forward, and it's usually a good step, but it's not the only way. So again, don't be too disheartened by that, but also... People who do have the equity and want to go, what's possible for me? Just think about this as an exercise pitching down the middle. Roundabout is, is going to be okay, but it can give you enough of an idea to know what suburb are you going to target? What would your potential buy price be? If that suburb is going to need a buy price of this and then times at 1.36 and be worth this out the other end after a cosmetic renovation, wouldn't that be nice to know now? So when you come out of here all fired up, you can go straight out into the market and start your due diligence in an area that works for you. Is that fair and reasonable? So if anyone, we, we try and keep this at an even pace. Um, we try and use year seven and year eight maths. That's why I asked who did, went to school, who did maths. We don't think it's too hard. But if you get a bit frustrated, I appreciate your sponge is getting fuller and fuller as the day goes on. 
I know he's talking finance on a Sunday evening at 6 o'clock at night is the most exciting thing you might want to do, but it's really exciting and really important if you think about, if you get through this, that you knew what was possible for you. No more going to these seminars or it's theory. There's no delivery there. You need to know what's possible for you to maintain that charge and that motivation and use this system. So is that fair enough? So if you're ever getting in the next half an hour, if your brain starts to fill up a bit, tap the person next to you to keep you moving along. Work together so then really you can get a clear picture. Is that a deal? Yeah. Thank you, everyone. So the first stage is available funds. Now, within your manuals, there's a little work thing to this. It's called class exercise. Step one, available funds. I'll stand still. So we're going to work through that. So then we're going to be working through structure. I'll give you an overview and we go from there. What entity are you going to do that in? We're then going to work through what's your strategy over the next year, two years, and three years. We're then going to work through what, what do you need to have in place, those buffers we talked about. We're going to talk about the deal that may be possible for you with the funds you have available. Talk about the finance that may be available to you in gross terms without having a one-on-one -on -one interview with you. So the first one is this one. So what we do in the first part there, so I'll just get a little pointed up in here. Here's an example. I have a property or a number of properties with a combined value of about $600,000. Just think about what a, a real estate agent or a valuer, if they turn up to your property today or your properties today, what do you think they would value them at? How much do you think they're worth? So then what we're doing is we're assuming we're doing a, either a, a low dock at 80% or a mainstream full dock lend, uh, refinance at 80%. So what we do is we then say, okay, I've got a total property or properties of $600,000 in worth. I'm then going to times that by 80%. So that works out what refinance might be available for you out in the market. The next thing to think about there is what existing loan or existing debt do I have at the moment? In this particular example, that's 150,000. So if you had, if you had loans of $200,000, your answer there is 200,000. The next thing to think about is, okay, after that, if I'm going to get a property at 600,000, times that by 80%, so that's 480,000, minus 150,000, how much how might, might I have available there would be $330,000. The next thing to think about is what do I have in offset, redraw, savings, or what might I have available through a joint venture or another partner? What we're trying to do here is get in gross terms how much money is potentially going to be available for you from all sources. Absolutely. And you might have an exam and I might say, I don't have any property assets at the moment. Pick a figure, work through it. Because as a professional renovator, there will be a point in time that doing these numbers will be important for you. Your call. Because I say, in this business, available funds is the number one thing. Available funds will get that project finished. It'll let you have enough money in there to keep your mind at bay. It allows you to be ready for those opportunities that may arise at any time. Yes. So, what's your question? Um, no, I don't, I just don't get it. You don't get it? No. So, do you have a property at the moment? Yes. Okay, what do you think that might be worth? Um, we've got two. Mm -hmm. So, it's combined, what might they be? Is this okay? Yeah, yeah. yeah? It's fine. So, what might they be in combined value? About 1.3. So, put 1.3 on right there. On the value? That's right. That's there, huh? Yeah. Then yeah. times that by 80%. Yep. Yep. And then if what existing debt do you have on that at the moment? You can tell me or not tell me. Um, I think ours, because one of them is actually in the middle of a project at the moment. Mm -hmm. so, so to assume N debt for that, and then for the one, and then the other one for the hold, what it might be, just the existing loan. 
The other one, well, one, I've got one which is 350 that's owing. And yes. And the one that's actually in project at the moment, um, are you asking for what's going to yeah, be? Yeah, what it would be at the end of the project. How much debt would it be at the end of the project in that example? There won't be any debt. Oh, no, I mean, but before you had sold it? Oh, 340. So you would be adding 350 and 340. Okay. And that would be your answer here. So then you would be saying, okay. okay. I'm going to do, so I had my 1.3 times that by 80% gave me an answer here. Then off that I was then going to minus that 340 and the 350. And that means I'm going to have approximately that much money available there. It's a bit different for your exercise with the sell. But if yes. you run with it this way for now, this is assuming sure. you're going to hold the property that you've got. Okay. That's great. Thanks. That's right. Is there, anyone got any other questions on that? Uh, don't worry about foreign. If you can get funds out of that from overseas, and I had a question here before, getting money out of property from overseas is a real challenge. You'd almost say it's almost insurmountable at the moment. It's only because of the instability within the countries and everyone's worried about each other. Especially in the US. That's correct. <laughs> so pay cash in the US. So is everyone right with that? One more question? Yeah, so some people might, for example, put all their savings and things into the offset account or they have an amount what's called available to them within their loan and that's called redraw. And that, so this means that might be available there for them. Yeah, mine's basically just a line of credit. So you don't worry about... So what is available to you in your line of credit? Um, and that's the answer for yeah. you to put into this spot here. Okay, thanks. So that was 40000 you put that there. So if you had a line of credit for 200,000 and you'd only used 160, you would have 40 available in redraw and that's what you would put in over here. Right, okay, thanks. Well, has everyone got their available funds right? Yeah. yeah. So the next thing we think about is, okay, is there people here who have equity available? Yes, anyone with no equity available? That's all right. You've got to know where you're starting. But you might, you, it might not work for you. You might have to go and find a partner. But if you go into an area and you master this system and you go and talk to someone about a potential deal, not, will you lend me some money? Go, I want to get into this project. This is this property. Here's all the homework I've done. Da, 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 da. Does that sound a bit better when you're going to talk to someone? But if you do have available funds, we'll keep working through. So this is the stage where some people might get a bit disheartened. This might not be for me. Do the exercise, people. Just get your brain used to doing it. A lot of the formulas are going to be the formulas you have used previous, like yesterday and today. We're just trying to re further reinforce those so you really get this. So the next step we go is your structure. Think about the, what Darren presented today. What do you think you might be using? A company in trust for your property ownership? Hands up. So you would just put a company in trust. That would be your answer. Now, there is some particular circumstances with people who may be renting at the moment or they may be a first home buyer, for example, and want to do a project. There are some cases you would do it as your principal place of residence and that can be for a multitude of reasons through maximising government grants to minimising capital gains tax. So have a conversation with Darren or have a conversation with us to make sure you're clear on what you believe is the best way forward from there. Is that fair and reasonable? Does everyone understand structure? If you say, I don't know, just book a meeting with Bell. That's what Darren's here for. We're all here to help you to get you to work through the system. How much? Well, I believe Darren's first appointment, well, I'm not quite sure, but I'd ring, ring him up and ask him about his fee structure. But for you, it can't come down to that. If you're, if, you're, if you're worried about, if the advice that you get is paramount to your success, you could talk to someone out there who might be $10,000 a meeting, for example, but if they're going to make you $100,000 on your next deal and then better deals on from there, is that advice worth, worth it? The current backyard accountant is not really going to be able to cope with you with this. Um, Paul, there is actually a, um, and Guy says there is a cost Thank you. price. Um, Bell Partners, there's a cost summary in that, so that's actually currently in your manual as an attachment at the back of company and tax structure, so his fees are clearly outlined there for you already. And this comes down to a really important point I'd like to emphasise. When you have a team for this business, one thing you need to ask the accountant, your mortgage guy, your solicitor, are you a property accountant slash solicitor slash mortgage guy? How many properties do you hold? How many deals have you done? 
explain to me about your last deal. How can you help me? Because if you go into the accountant and he's not a property accountant, he rents his house and drives a Sigma, is he really going to take you where to where you want to go? If you go into a mortgage broker and it's an old guy in his late 50s and goes, I've been in banking for 34 years. He's not your guy, all right? He's not your guy. He won't have a clue. He only knows how to do it this way. So it's really important that people on your team are property people. So I think that's one of the really important things. So that's a takeaway. That's the questions you ask people. And out of my whole time here for three years, I've only been asked that question twice. And I say at every single presentation, it's... So talk to Darren about property. He'll whiz you. Talk to, talk to me about property. I can talk about that. Talk to the Renovating for Profit team about what they're doing in their own deals. Hang around people that are doing this. It's like the birds of a feather thing. Going to a normal, for me, going to a normal broker or a bank teller, you're going to say, hey, I'm going to buy, renovate and sell property. And they're going to look at you and go, oh, I don't know how to do this and I can't get this through. And they, all, they just don't, they don't understand where you're going and what you're trying to do. So do you want to hang out with someone and have a, an accountant or a solicitor or a finance guy who only has one investment property and has never renovated before and he doesn't aspire to have property? Is that your guy? No. So really, step three from here is your structure. We talked about the personal name options. We talked about the principal place of residence options. We've got companies. We've got companies and trusts. Now, for me, I'm a self-employed businessman. I've been doing that for uh, at least more than 10 years in, in company and trust structures. There's so much flexibility for income distribution, uh, maximising lending out of banks, um, asset protection, different things. For me, personally, a company and trust is the way to go. There are some exceptions for people maximising the use of uh, principal and hence personal name property. But again, the company and trust, we're here to teach you the upper level professional property stuff. Take the tip from the professionals, head down that road. If you don't, in the first one or two projects, you will by the end because company and trusts are the way to go. So is everyone right on um, structure? So, so hands up who's going to start with a cosmetic renovation. That's it. How many do you think you might do in the first 12 months? Good, so your short-term plan is two cosmetic renovations. That is very achievable. You may not have a social life for short periods of time while the project's on, and that's okay, but it's not going to engulf your world. That is very doable for almost anyone in this room to be able to get a roll of projects like that going on. What's your medium-term plan? Who in year two wants to start doing some structural work? That's great. So think about what's your plan. Cherie will talk to you at the, end, at the end of this program. What's your plan? What's your business plan? Have a think about what that might be for you. Um, a tip for me is uh, a couple of things. If you haven't done renovation before, start on a, like a, an easier cosmetic one. It just means that you're not, you're not going in the Olympics before you've even gone for a run around the block. And the other way to think about it is please don't quit your, do quit your jobs after, before you've done two, maybe three projects. You need to get a rounding of this business. The first one may go really well, but then the next one may not go so well, but then you'll have one that goes okay. I'm a big fan on don't put so much pressure on yourself. Don't try and look in the market to make deals work. Do it in a nice, calm way through transition. There are some people who could go and take the, the approach of quitting their jobs and going now, but there's very few people in this room that that is actually smart for. Is that okay? This is a business. It's a professional business. You're going to university now. You need to get out and do some prac work. You need to spend time in this system. But yes, this is achievable, what we talk about in here. But also be kind to yourself, your family, and your nerves. Sometimes, that's the way. You can, you can don't bite off more than you can chew because it's an, 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 sometimes an interesting experience. The last thing you want to do is go, I need to make some money to put some things on my kid's table. I have to take this deal, pay 20 or 30 grand over the money. That's 20 or 30 grand that if you could just take your time, another deal came across another week or two later and there's more money in it. Do people understand what I'm saying here? We do get this almost every week. Um, we have people who uh, we believe are a bit premature in that and that's okay, but just be very, think about it. Let's put the buffers in place if that's your story. If you need to be kept alive for 12 months or six months to get your first project through, let us know. We put it in the strategy. So that's why we do it this way. So is everyone right with their strategy? Everyone have a bit of an idea what they want to do over the next one to three years? I don't think I could help anyone with that because it would be your own story. 
but you might be amazed at what is possible for you. Our step four is you. So basically think about this, um, these are a couple of allowance we talked about. So the first one here is day-to-day -day living costs, and I just call that living. A lot of people might say, hey, Paul, the income that I'm bringing in through my business or my job is more than enough to keep food on my table, pay my insurance, pay my car rego, and keep my family alive. In that particular case, we don't allow anything extra there, but just know within your strategy, I'll put a little note there saying you are going to fund that from your job or from your income. But if you're in the case also where you may know that your family is costing you a couple of hundred dollars, say $200 a week more than you're earning, and you want to make sure you can get into this property thing, do we allocate $10,000 a year or $200 a week to make sure that your family stays in the lifestyle you're accustomed to, but then also you know that for that period of time, you can focus on getting your business underway, get through your two projects that you've committed to, and over the first 12 months, your family's right. Would that be a good feeling? Is everyone right with what they might want put down there for living for them in this particular example? The next thing we talk about is holding costs associated with existing properties. Let's say you had two existing properties and they each cost you $10,000 a year and that is the difference between the net rental income you get and the cost of interest and property managers and things like that. So we would say, okay, let's put $20,000 in place, so two properties, $10,000 each, so you knew that for 12 months your living was catered for and those properties you never had to worry about putting any money into those. Would that work for people? That is one of the big ways that you might see in some of the magazines and the things people holding probably between three and upwards of properties, probably even five and six is regular. They use equity to service the loans people. That's a takeaway. You being able to earn that amount of money to keep a portfolio alive will typically come from using equity in a smart way to fund your life. We do a little exercise later called the bucket theory where we'll reinforce that again. Thank you. It is the way, people. How is that person earning $65,000 a year and owning five investment properties? How do they do that? Has anyone ever asked that? It's equity, people. It's not con saying equity, mate, buy a boat. It's saying put equity away off to the side to hold my portfolio up because that's smart. Because I know over time doing projects is going to make me more money. I know holding property will make me money. You've got to keep everything alive and going. Is that fair enough? So the last amount is you sleep at night. Hands up again, who's the warriors? What amount's right for you? Is that 10 grand? Is that 50 grand? Is it 5 grand? Are you young, dumb and ready to go for a risk and go, I oh, don't worry, mate, I just want to get into the deal. Is that you? True. There you go. I don't care about this sleep at night thing. A couple of beers and I'll sleep every night, you know. <laughs> so come on, think about it, people, though, because especially in a partner relationship, there will be one who's more conservative than the other and it's not a gender thing, it's about a 50-50 split, people. So think about what would, if you had it tucked away, what would make sure that you never lay in bed at night and looked at the ceiling worrying about getting your renovation business and, hey, I've got no money. What figure is that for you? Has everyone got their own figure? So what we do here is we go, what was your living allowance? What was your holding cost for existing property? And if you've only got home, you might actually want to allow to service the loan on home for a period of time to help you with your cash flow or get you in. It's not necessarily investment properties. There's ways in the strategy we're trying to make it work for everyone. But we also, so we need to add that, the holding costs and your sleep at night. And th we have the other. Other can be interesting things. Hands up who's been to a share market trading course. Hands up who's got other businesses that might need an overdraft or some extra cash funds. That other could be that for you. Within a strategy, it has to suit your whole world. You may not, renovations might be your thing at the moment, but you may have other business interests and things to consider. We have even uh, allowances in strategies for weddings, holidays overseas, different things like that, because the last thing you do is your property business to hamper your lifestyle too much. You've got to allow a realistic strategy, not push it to the line. Life's out there, life's expensive, and there's other things to think about. So that's what we have with the other. And as everyone know, it's add this, add this, add this, and add this. Does everyone have the answer on the bottom there about what's right for them? You will or you do? Oh, come on. 
You're giving up on yourself. That's the way. So what we do here is we're going through the calculations that Cherie talked about. We're talking about purchase costs are typically 4% or acquisition costs are typically 4% of the value of the purchase of the property. We're saying in an 80% loan scenario, the equity required is about 20%. We're then saying for you to have that project self-service through the course of that, that deal, we allow for cosmetic renovation six months of loan servicing. So when you enter into that project, you, don't, you know that you have enough money to buy it, complete the project, list it on the market for five to six weeks, and then enter into a contract that's probably going to be five to six weeks and have a month float. So we have that 4% of money in there. That's also to do with any other loans and financing costs, whether that might be some break fees, some clawback or different things. So we're following the same numbers. And again, for the cosmetic renovation, we're saying that's about 10%. So really, in an example is, hey, my first deal is a cosmetic renovation. Hands up. You would use 38% in this example. So what you would be saying, OK, in that, I believe I'm going to buy a property for this price. I know my acquisition costs are there. It's a straightforward calculation. Same for your loan equity, but assuming overall in a cosmetic renovation example, you need to have 38% of the purchase price to enable you to complete that project and get all the way through. The other thing to think about if you're choosing your areas is the price disparity. And that's where we use the calculator down here and tie it back in. So if you knew you were buying for $100,000 here, and doing all that work, you know you would need to sell that for $136,000 out there to make your 15% profit. Does everyone remember doing these numbers the other day? Does doing it again help you reinforce that and understand it a bit more? Has anyone got any questions on that? So the same example for the structural. Now some people say to me, hey, why is this 10% down here where Cherie talks in a different way? If you're going to do a structural renovation, we assume you're going to use a builder. Now, we assume that that builder will have done a quote for you and you would enter into what's called a fixed price building contract with them. And then if you are able, well, when you are able to supply that to us, we can get the bank to lend you money so you don't have to give that all to the builder. Would that be a good thing? So the interesting thing is, depending on the area you are, it may be almost the same amount of money that you put in to do a cosmetic renovation as it may be to do a structural renovation. It all comes down to being smart with the building contract and getting the lending from that. Does that make sense for everyone? Yeah. So that's the only example where it won't follow Cherie's number of the 25%. That's talking about getting a builder to do that and the bank will lend 20%, lend 80% of that building contract and then putting it into a number that we can use on gross terms. Is that clear for everyone? All right, so has everyone got a bit of an idea what's possible for them in there in their, pro their project or deal? Now, this is the page where here's an example. Hey, I'm going to buy a property for 855000 And I know if I'm going to keep working on that, I know that I'm going to have to sell it out the other end for 1160 to make my 15%. Again, with a structured renovation, I'm going to buy for 720000 And I know there I'm going to do a, a renovation there. And what do I need to sell that out the other end for? But the interesting thing there is, see, you needed the same amount of money to do those projects. Don't let these numbers scare you, people. I'll just try to come with a, a number that worked through. So it backs my statement saying, you may have $300,000. You're saying a buy price of around eight fifty, eight fifty five for a structural. But then if you were, that was a, uh, a cosmetic, excuse me, but with a structural renovation, you'll be buying at seven twenty and going through that way with the same amount of money. I know that sounds weird, but when you work through the numbers, it just works that way. Does anyone have any questions on that? Beautiful. So this is the page where it puts it together for you. You'll put down, when you work through your available funds, what was the total of the available funds you had on that first bit of paper? Put that here. Then say, how much money did I need for my personal considerations, my, my living money? my hold money, my sleep at night money. Put that figure in here. So basically we're getting the, the available funds minus the pers personal consideration says, I have this amount of money for my next property deal. The next thing we work on is we just transfer that same figure from here down to here. So the funds for the deal. 
and you say, okay, my next deal is going to be a cosmetic renovation. I know I need 38% for that. So what we do is we get the money you have here, divide that by 0.38 if it's a cosmetic, or 0.45 for a structural, and that will give you the buy price. An example may be if I have $100,000 equity, I'm going to divide that by 38%. It means your buy price is somewhere around about the 250, 260 mark. Sorry, Paul, it's 42% for a cosmetic. Oh, 42. I, I just added in the, the little bit for back and from the page. So it's the same for the buy price there. And then for your price disparity, we're saying, OK, if I was going to have my buy price, I then transact further here. And I know that if I'm going to do a cosmetic renovation, that's going to be 10% and make my 15% 15 profit. I know I need to times that by 1.36%. And that would be what my end sales price would need to be. Again, we're just going back over the numbers you worked about for the last couple of days. Now, does anyone have any questions on that or anything they'd like to clarify? The room goes thick, you can feel it, can't you? I have a question. Thank you. Yes, I've got a question. Um, if you're using a builder, but then you're only using them to lock up stage and mm -hmm. you're also going to contract some people separately, mm -hmm. can you only get the loan for the builder composition? So how that could work is you would get a builder loan for the builder composition and if you could supply the quotes from the contractors you are going to use, you can typically get lending from that. But if you were going to do the garden, for example, <laughs> yourself, um, they, you would have to fund that out of your own money. So it's all about being be able to supply documentation to the lender that is a, like a contract or a quote which clarifies what they are doing for you and how much that will cost and that is a fixed cost. Yes? Yeah, similar question um, just in, re <laughs> in relation to um, uh, getting finance against that fixed price contract yes. from the builder. Um, if... Uh, Sorry, I've gone blank for a second. <laughs> I forgot what my question was. Can I come back? <laughs> no problems. Yes. Hi, Paul. Just a question about the credit rating inquiries. Yes. When you make a credit inquiry for yourself, right, does that affect you in any way? No, Later because they don't actually... The if, you've done it on your, if you've done it on yourself, the answer is no. But if you go through someone else to make that inquiry on your behalf or to get a credit card or any of those things, so another party, they will register. But if you go onto mycreditfile.com.au, it won't show that you've requested your file. Oh, he's back again. Sorry, I remembered. <laughs> so if, um, if you're going to obtain finance against the contract, um, does it still allow you to keep the loan out of business bank where you're going to get all the development conditions and whatnot? No, what we do is we use that as a normal mainstream lend. So we try and say, OK, they're going to buy this property and renovate it and hold it. So we would put that in the normal mainstream lending. So the aim is that the same interest rate should be applicable to the property purchase as for the renovation through the builder. So it's the whole story. It's the whole story. Cool. Yes? Um, if you've got three or four properties, would it be better to sell three properties and put all the money in one property and take the equity out of the one property or keep the full four properties? Uh, interesting question. Um, is there a reason you would want to sell those three properties? Uh, it, it's horses for courses for there. That's more of a, uh, you, is it worth that person selling? Um, what's the loan amount on those? Can we get any money out on a refinance? Those sorts of things. It's a, if you wanted to talk about that later, we could talk a bit more personally about that. Uh, my, my feel is always it's about available money and what is that for that particular person? Is that through refinance? Is it maybe selling one? Is it maybe selling two? It's one of, it's one of those questions. So is everyone right? Has everyone got their answer here, what they think their, their forecast buy price might be with the amount of money they have and allowing some personal considerations? Hands up. Is everyone from that buy price then able to work what their forecast resale price is for that particular project? Yes? Beautiful. So then we talk about finance. So you don't have to know the ins and outs of this, but hopefully today's been able to share more with you. 
you're going to talk about, okay, what type of lender am I? Am I a full doc person? Am I a low doc person? Should I be a low doc person? I need to set myself up that way. Um, am I a no doc person? What's, what's my story? What type of lender or type of loan will you be going for? The next consideration is, how am I going to do my renovations? With a cosmetic renovation, typically we use your own funds to pay for the subcontractors for you to manage them for that 10% of the purchase price renovation. In the structural, are you, going to, are you going to use a builder for that? Are you going to use a fixed price contract? And again, with the example down here, is that fixed price contract going to take you to lock up? Is that going to take you through to occupation? What is your story with that? So what, what, how do you plan to pay for your renovations? The next thing really from there is what documentation am I going to need? And in your folders there, there's a, a comprehensive listing of the documentation you will need if you're a, a full doc person, a low doc person, um, doing a structural renovation with a builder. All that documentation you'll need is, is in the fat manuals there. But think about that again. Allow the hour, an hour and a half to get your documentation together. Often you will not get your documentation together in the first go. You might, have to get, you might get 50, 60 percent through it. You might have to follow this up. You might have to follow that up. Be proactive with that. And then also just work with your time frame. So if you know there's in your area, you're getting close to your due diligence being complete. Cherie will talk about sort of 12 weeks due diligence in an area. How it usually works is come and work with us to work through what your buy price and your disparity might be for you to pick your suburb. Then you start working and doing your due diligence within that suburb for a couple of weeks. Then come back and say, yes, Paul, I think we're right. This is my buy price. This is my sell price. I'm going to work on that. And then what we do is we then probably from week two, three or four, we work onwards forward from there. So when you're ready at the end of your due diligence time, you've got a pre-approval that you wave under the real estate agent's nose. I know this property is worth this much because I've done my homework. I know if I'm going to do this project, this is what I'm going to do and this is how much it's going to cost me. And I know at the end this property is going to be worth this much. So you see how this all sort of works in? So allow the time frames and realistic time frames. If you're new to an area, you'll need at least 12, 12 weeks. If you've been in an area before, you need to know why are certain streets worth more than others. Um, why do, they're the sorts of things you need to know and not just go carte blanche in off, off median house price. You have to intimately understand what you're doing. So working hand in hand with Darren, myself, your due diligence system and the team here is really important through that first two to three month period. Is that fair enough? So again, if you know you've got an auction coming up in three to four weeks, you usually get the notification. There's usually four or five weeks. Get everything in order and keep moving from there. So we then start talking about it. There's a couple of keys here. Can I have a time check, please? 7.30. Thank you. Okay. Key to refinancing. Borrow as much as you can. The available money, again, this is the sixth time I've said that, is a real key for you. There's so many ways it gives you flexibility and peace of mind. Refinance, get a line of credit, have that somewhere in your world to give you the functionality of the credit card. But then really from there, you've got to do other things. If you have an existing home and that is what you're refinancing to get your money available for your projects, we and your accountant need to know the difference between what your home loan amount is and the money you're going to use for your new business. So what we basically do is put a loan, we split that in two or three components. So then at tax time, it's a lot easier for you. But then also, if you're structuring your portfolio correctly, all your incomes and your profits should be focusing on knocking your home loan off as well. So it gives us the ability to know what that is, so then we can focus on that. Is everyone right with that? So, your preferred strategy for the next deal, try and, we try and use a no-frills loan, it makes it cheaper for you. Typically, you're not going to be in there for, the worst case in a structure, you might be in there for 18 months, worst case, two years, but you might only be in there for six to 12 months. So, having a no-frills loan is the way to go. As we talked about before, go for the variable interest rate. Always select an interest-only loan. Again, just further reinforcement. Consider all the fees involved, including the exit fee. Don't make that prohibitive. Just make sure that you're understanding that so you can put it within your feasibility. Know what our system is and how to work through that. We will talk to you about structure, strategy, 
you consider right personal considerations, those sorts of things. We follow that system because we find it works and it gives you what we call a sound strategy that can work for you moving forward. Again, it keeps coming up some of these points again and again, as we said. Some people might say, okay, Paul, we talked a bit about time frames in this presentation. If it was straight down the middle, we'd never met you, we'd never met you before. We wanted to be introduced to your business and we wanted to be ready to go. How, what would that look like? So what you would do is you would be preparing your finance proposal and working with us. That could take a few days. We then get that off to the lender and somewhere between three and five days they have a look at it. They don't usually look at it on day one and day two. They'll look at it usually on day three, four or five. And then once they're happy with that, they'll give what's called a conditional approval. What they do from there is it's typically pending evaluation. So we say valuation about five days. The example for this is if you have an investment property with a tenant that's managed by a property manager, the, we get the, the lender rings the valuer, the valuer rings the property manager, the property manager get, has to ring the tenant and arrange access for the valuer. Sometimes it takes a few days and somewhere between three and five days, but if you allow five days, you're usually right. And then really from there, once those conditions come back, the valuation's right. There's a lot of cases at the moment where the lender and the mortgage insurer is asking the valuer to re-clarify some points of that valuation. It's happening more and more. They're, again, they're really making sure that they're dotting their I's, crossing their T's, and the mortgage, in, mortgage insurer un, totally understands the deal and the security property that they're embarking on. So really, the reason we had 10 days in here is we assume the lender takes about five days but if it has to go to the mortgage insurer, it just gets in their pile and it usually takes an extra three to five days to come through. So after you get the formal approval, that's pretty much when you would call that a pre-approval. You could wave under the nose of your real estate agent and use that as a negotiating tool. Then once you're happy with that, you found your property and the letters are done, they then send off to get loan documentation done by their solicitors. Remember how we talked about the legal, solicitors' legal fees and things? They get them involved. That takes about five days and they usually express post those documents to your place of residence or send them to your solicitor if you're purchasing them. Now really from here, once you sign the loan documentations, that usually takes a couple of days. You need to get your insurances in place, let them know a few details, meet with your solicitor, get those things signed. And then you need those three to five days to get all the people in the room we talked about before. We allow about 10 days overall for that process. Now really from there, I'm just hedging my bets and putting a miscellaneous and contingency clause in there, as you do for your building projects, so we do for our process. So really the long and the short of it, it's about 42 days. So really if that's why we say for you entering into contracts for purchase, a minimum of 42 days, Try and squeeze up to 56 or 63. It means no one sweats, you don't have the agent on your tail and you know you're going to get through in a fair and reasonable amount of time. Yes? Well, is that valuation for the property that you're going to buy? It could be for the refinance or it also could be for the property you're going to buy as well. Because, yeah, if you haven't found the deal yet, how mm -hmm. do you get pre-approval uh, without well, them valuing so what you're sometimes going to buy? They'll, they'll give you the pre-approval and the last thing they have to do is the valuation. But there has a few cases of late where they go, they're buying in that area, they don't even send a valuer out now. What the lenders have been more on that, so what the lenders have been doing over a sh uh, probably the last three or four years is getting all these valuation information. And people like RP Data and Red Square, what they're going to do away is valuers and they're going to be doing desktop. So they'll use computer modelling and things to work out valuations. But until they get to that fully, they'll always allow for that valuation time frame. So in some pre-approvals, you haven't picked a property yet and they will do a valuation, but they're getting more and more cases where they're just knowing you're buying in suburb XYZ. Yeah, that looks about right and we'll roll with it from there. Did that answer that question? So really, people, I'll come back one. Allow 42 days, as said, 63 days is great. It's also good for you. You may be able to get some access, early access before you settle. It means you're into that project before you even own it. That is highly possible. I've been doing all my deals that way for at least six or seven years. And also, if you can buy a bit more time on there, there is some cases where you can actually finish before you even own the property. Wouldn't that be nice? So you're always trying to minimise your whole cost on your project and your deals. So think outside the square. This is where having a good solicitor 
on your side who understands property will know that time is money. Time can allow you to get your subbies in order. It can allow you to get your materials in order. All the lead times on some of those things. A bit more time is usually good for you in your project, in management and in completion and you having your act together. Now, on anything we've talked about at the moment, has anyone got any questions? This is great. Okay. Now, what we do from here is we talked about this thing about managing cash flow. One of the things we talked about and I reiterated about an hour ago is a smart property person, almost no matter what size, whether they're Joe Smith or Donald Trump, they use equity to service their loans and keep their strategy alive. This bucket principle, the lovely ladies here, we're going to show to you in another way so visual people might get that. People who are auditory might have heard me say that a few times and get that. It's really a case of you understanding what's going on. So what we have here, thank you, think about this as your bucket, this lovely thing here. Think about what we're talking about is maximising your available funds, all these bits of money here. So what we need to do is to fill your bucket up as much as possible. Can I have a question? Sorry, hi. You um, mentioned about the desktop valuations yes. for approvals. Mm -hmm. Are they planning on heading that way also? I believe so. What? Okay, without inspecting the property? Absolutely. That's insane. It's good for the banks. So they don't, they don't have to pay. approvals, fine. But yeah. just say, for example, oh, you're I, I the agree next, with you. Yeah. But they're the all about squeezing that extra couple of hundred dollars on their bottom line from multiple deals. So they're want, wanting to head to that absolutely even when you're they are. just re-evaluating it for your next project, for so what some So on that, we actually get lenders often that we want them to go in the property mm. and we insist that they, I think yeah, Cherie exactly. talks about, go in the 100%. property. But there's also, in some cases, on a refinance, sometimes putting a slightly higher valuation, you know they're going to do a desktop modelling, will get you more money available than if a value were turned up. It's almost also almost like a horses for courses. It's a gamble. It is, uh, yes, it is. Mm. But what you're trying to do is a calculated game play to maximise the outcome for you. Hmm. But how do you control that one? You know, uh, so it would depend. Like you, you might pick a lender <laughs> because I know I can get a certain value are out there to value that property for so you. So you do have that control with the... Uh, in some cases, a, yes. Some influence. Yeah, that's yeah. correct. <laughs> it used to be a before GFC, it was rife. Mm -hmm. It was amazing what you could suck at. Having certain values would be less conservative than others mm. or more friendly than others. It was a real key. It's it, a bit yeah. harder to control at the moment, but you still can do that to right a now. certain degree. Mm. Okay. Sorry to digress, people. Thanks. So what we've got, people, is we've got all our money. We've now emptied out our little bucket. We've only got one thing left there. That's the sleep at night money. There you go. So what we're going to do here is we're going to say, okay, I'm going to embark. I need to know I have that much for my sleep at night, that much for my living, and I'm going to need to allow that much to hold my existing portfolio. My plan really is to never touch that money if I, if I don't have to. Is that fair enough? Yeah. So we say, okay, this is my available money over here. I need to... Um, buy that particular property. I've got to put 10% in. I then need to put some money down for lead time items for my builder or for my project. Thank you. So then you go, okay, settlement time's coming. You know, oh, I've got to put 20% loan equity into that project. I've then got to pay for my purchase costs. There's my stamp duty. There's my legals. Oh, great, here we go. This is what happens when you're about to settle. Did anyone know? Who's tried to settle properties before? Oh, have you got another hundred bucks? Have you got another document? Come on. So you, your money keeps going in. So I've now bought that property. Everyone's getting the gist. So I go, okay, I now know that I need to use my renovation, my 10% renovation. Door hardware, light fittings, paint. Oh, hang on. Painters are expensive these, eh? Painting. Concreters. Oh, here we go. Renderers, if that's your thing. Doing people doing landscaping. Seeing what's happening in the bucket, it's filling up people. So then you also then say, okay, I then need to make sure that I'm going to service that loan for that whole time. So it keeps coming out and coming out and coming out. Do you see, people, why it's really important? These projects get you all the way full and suck all your money out. You need to make sure you've got money left here over here. Understand where we're coming from? 
So what you need to do, and people might say, oh no, I've, I've got to do something else and I don't, I don't want to have to think about little Johnny. We've catered for little Johnny down here. Okay, oh, oh, I'm, I'm starting to get a little bit more worried and I, and I didn't forecast enough money for my renovation. I need to add another $3,000. Come on, keep going in there. So what happens very much is you've got to keep your bucket as full as possible because then what happens basically intrinsically is you've, you, you get to the point in time of your project where you've finished, you're on the market, you've been on the market for four or five weeks and you're going, this has got to sell, this has got to sell, I need a contract, I need a contract. Has anyone been there before? Yeah. It's that certain laugh you get when you talk about that. Actually, It's the, oh, come on. That's one of the most ner unnerving times. It's the, it's the bolt of reality, isn't it? How good is my project and how is that being received in the market? The thing that you need to make sure is that you have all this money available to you because otherwise it allows you the bit of flexibility so you don't take that lower offer that you really shouldn't take. Don't back yourself into the corner. Make sure you've got enough money in your bucket to keep that going through because what will happen at the end is when your projects, and I'll use this for the analogy as your money then, once you renovate that property and you make your money, look what happens people, what happens to your bucket of money? What happened then? It overflows people. So managing your cash flow is really important. Cash flow may not and usually is not in the form of your income coming in from your job or your business. Cash flow in this business of professional property is managed through smart equity allocation. Have we, do people understand that from, from this point in time? You need to do this up front so you don't get caught. You might think, hey, that, this guy must be a real risk taker and put creative deals together. Absolutely. But are you ever going to fall over if you follow this, this property strategy and this due diligence system? The answer is no way. So people, think about it in that way. So managing cash flow again, it's about having available money there, working through your structure, your strategy, what you need to have in place, what your next deal is going to look like, and then for your loan. Thanks for that. Thank you. Thank you. It's nice having money overflowing, isn't it? <laughs> so the good thing is then, thank you, is that when that profit comes through, it all starts all over again. You may choose to do the same type buy price. You may get a little bit gamer and think, I can step up a little bit. You might then embark from that cosmetic to that structural renovation. It's really important that you keep working through. Just know that one deal is not a measure of what this business is like. Do a few deals, get used to that. So who in this room is committed to put this down to get through at least two to three deals in the next two years? Come on, guys. Look around. If you've got a partner there, look them in the eye and say, I'm into this. I know it's not going to be e it may not be easy all the time, but if I ever got a question, I can look at the manuals, I can call the renovating for profit team, I can talk to that weird guy from Nelson Bay who talked a lot and talk through that about the questions we're, we're going through there. So really from here, people, I hope that's been enjoyable and informative for you today. Who actually found out from before, who actually didn't know what is possible for them now? Any more people? Yeah. Anyone more excited than they were before? Yeah, that's the way. So how it works from here is I'll hang around tonight for a while. Um, Julie Pinto up the back, the lovely Julie. Um, we have um, meetings at the Renovating for Profit office at Balmain. They will be on Tuesday and Wednesday if people would like that. What we try and do is we're not in Sydney and especially this year, there's a lot of people flying in, out and around into Sydney. If you're an interstate person, um, try and book as you can to suit with, in with your flights. Now, if you're a Sydney person who may have kids and a business or a job and things and this week doesn't work for you, that's fine. Just contact the office. I come to Sydney three or four times a month and, again, we do fly around the country to the different places and see what works for you. There's three things we ask you to come when you come to those meetings. There's one document in there that's called a client snapshot. That gives me enough information to work through with you what is possible and I also then write some notes on from there. So if you come into that meeting, if you can please have that document completed, that will really streamline that meeting. Again, it's about being professional, it's about stepping up. As someone who knows their world realistically should take no more than 15 minutes to do that. It talks about what your name is, it talks about your mobile phone number, it talks a bit about your credit history, it talks about what property you own and what loans you may have. It talks about the credit cards you have. 
if you actually don't know that information, for my opinion, getting being a professional renovator and professional property person is about knowing that information and being able to spit it out straight away. It means that you're proactive with your world. The next thing to bring is an, is an open idea, an open book about what you want to do over the next uh, one to three years renovation wise and also bring some questions that may be around that may, may, may be applicable for you. The next thing really is bring a smile but also try and be on time because often there is people who if you're running 10 or 15 minutes late the ne next person who's after you would actually be the one who's going to be late for their flight. So if you can do that and just allow an extra five or ten minutes at the renovating for profit office to find a park and then get down those stairs to that wonderful warehouse down there on the water. So how that works is um, Julie will be taking meetings this afternoon. They're from early in the morning from 8 o'clock. We can even do them till 9, 9.30 at night if you like for the, on the Tuesday and the meetings on the Wednesday. Is everyone clear about how those meetings work? There's no charge for that first meeting. And even with me and my business, the first few meetings talking and a meet and greet, there is no charge. There will be a fee associated of around 500 bucks if you choose to proceed and go forward with that strategy. But that can, you may be two or three meetings down the line, you'll get a summary strategy at least of what, what is possible for you following the process that we did here today. And really for, um, what we then do is say that's a, that works with the strategy for you. So what, we'd like, what I'd like to say is just make sure I've covered all my bases for today. Is there anyone who may have a question way out there in finance land or anything we've talked about today? There'd have to be one more somewhere, surely. No. So there are, there's another thing there um, that we have out there. The way we uh, talked about in our process today is on this card. Julie will also have some of those and some business cards. Um, and what I'd like to say is get into this business. It is possible. Um, property and renovation has made me a lot of money over the time. I only ever had one deal in Wurunga in Sydney that I lost money on back in 2001. It was one of those deals that everything went wrong that could possibly go wrong. But that's because I didn't have a system that I follow. I didn't have rules that applied. I didn't have buffers in place. But you've got to follow this system because this can be a possibility for many of you people in this room. So don't spend these three days learning all these things. Actually get out there and get into it because it is really possible for you. A question? Yeah, just a quick one. We actually are doing a, well, we've just bought a property about four weeks ago. Great. And the number's a bit worried now. Does it work? <laughs> <After> this course. <laughs> yeah. No, it, it'll work, but it's well, end up with a smaller than 15%, I think. Sure. Okay. But uh, what we're trying to do is, it, it's, uh, it's not a structural. Yeah. Maybe it is, but it's not. But we're also looking to put a townhouse on the rear of the property. Mm -hmm. So that's be structured as two separate... So then that's what we would talk about. That's what the, the strategy, yes, but then that particular deal would have a component of doing that and then doing a, a subdivision and things yeah. on the back. Yeah. Okay. So thanks for your time today, everyone. Hopefully that was informative. And I'll keep you up here. Thank you. All right, um, we're about to wrap up in five minutes, guys. One thing I will tell you is that professional renovators, and um, when it comes to debt, you have to look at the way you look at debt. Pro reality is professional renovators live off their equity, okay? So in terms of funding their lifestyle, any profits that you make, you live off your profit. So it's okay to do that. Don't think that you're going back in equity. That's just what funds your lifestyle moving forward. So you've just got to change the way that you look at debt because a lot of people struggle in that regard. The last thing I want to show you tonight, just in regards to the finance, we're obviously going to come back and cover a lot of things on the finance side tomorrow morning in terms of all the negotiation strategies and how you submit offers. But one thing I will, um, Paul alluded to tonight is that you need to prepare a professional finance proposal for the banks. Now, you've got the template in your manuals. In fact, I was just saying to the girls the other, the other day, this template's looking a bit shabby. So I, I said to them, I think I should create a new upgraded version of the finance proposal. Um, so basically, uh, what it is, I'll just quickly go through this. So you've got a template of this at the moment. Um, and so what it is, there's four sections. The first section is the applicant. So this is all the details of the, the bank, what the bank is going to require from you. We always know they want 100 points of identification, your CRA, your credit reference file. So make sure you all go and subscribe to that right now. 
So it's got those details. It's got um, about the applicant's expertise. In this course, you're going to get a graduation certificate that says you've been trained in property renovation and development. It's a piece of paper to me. You're certainly not going to use it to go out and get a job. Um, but what you can use it for is certainly your finance proposal. So you can start to paint the picture that you're actually in the business of property development and renovation. So any experience you've got there, any past projects you've done, certainly outline something there in that regards. Um, you know, your corporate organisational charts I spoke to you about yesterday in terms of setting up your property business, you can start to use some of those templates within the system to show people, show the bank you're doing this as a business now. You'll actually, that's your graduation certificate that you'll receive tomorrow night. Your assets, your liability summary. Um, basically, you always have to fill out an application for a bank loan. That's a that's standard thing. This is actually a copy of your CRA file that you'll get. And basically, you know, your last three statements of your bank statements, they're mandatory things that the bank always Ask. We know they're going to ask for them, so just give it to them in advance. The next sub, the next section is suburb due diligence, and this is where you're basically going to start pulling in your suburb due diligence checklist. You're going to start pulling in, or you know those demographic reports we spoke about yesterday that you can pull up free from the internet. You're going to basically start pulling those in. Your media clippings, Balmain's baby boom, whatever it may be, demand for family homes in this area. You're going to stick. You're basically going to put a copy of all those positive newspaper articles in the bank. So when the bank gets this, they can see that there's demand in your suburb for that particular style of property. Um, you know, I would even suggest that you go and take photos. A lot of these you can pull from the internet. You cut and paste. Like you type in Balmain suburb profile or Balmain, it'll bring up so all different pictures of the village, whatever it may be. And it doesn't have to be Balmain, obviously your own suburbs. If there are no pictures that you can pull from free from the internet, just get in the car, take some pictures. Take a picture of the park. Take a picture of the ocean. Take a picture of, what, picture of whatever it may be, the nice harbour view, whatever, the mountains. So you just basically go in and you're just going to give them an idea idea of what the suburb is actually like in that regard. There's your demographic reports. The next section is your property due diligence section. This is where you're going to put the agent's brochure. You're going to put your floor plans. You know, take when you go through your, you know, when you do your property inspection, and I said take a digital camera, you're basically going to get these digital images from when you do that property inspection, okay? So just paint the picture of what the banks um, are going to want to know. Um, your contract of sale. Now, your, com your sales comparables. What you want to do is you basically want to pull out the details. Go back to your property due diligence system and start pulling out all the properties that basically are a slightly higher price in your area that are similar to your properties, okay? So you go back. Now, if you don't have a due diligence system, you can't do that, okay? Okay, so you start to put all of those through there. You've got your property due diligence checklist so they can see you've thoroughly chucked everything. And the last section is the project, project, project outcomes. What are you actually going to do with this property? If it's a structural renovation, you can include that, you know, that floor FSR calculator um, where you can get an initial 60 square metres on, you know, include that template. If you've had an architect or a draftsman do some preliminary sketches, you know, include those so the bank can see that this property has got upside. And basically your calculators, your resale calculator, your purchase price calculator, include those. Include a full copy of your financial feasibility so they can see there's a profit margin at the end. Um, and basically, if you're going, if, you know, even if it's a rental property that you're going to hold, you know, input the insurances, everything. So what you're doing is you're preempting to the bank everything they want to know. You basically submit that to Paul. Paul would submit that to the bank. And what it's just doing, it's your opportunity for them not to assess you as a number, but as a professional investor. Because if you don't do this sort of stuff, then you will be basically, you know, fed through a computer and, and all sorts of things where you just don't have the opportunity to explain that this is actually a good deal. So that does it for you and if you use this sort of stuff you've got a much better chance of getting finance approval because what it's saying to the bank is this chick's actually done thorough due diligence on the property this looks like a sure bet I feel very comfortable that the bank's not going to lose money on us okay and the reality is going through that process you'll get through that and if it's saying that it is strong well it is obviously a strong deal so it is a bit of a discipline. You know, reality is it'll probably take you two or three hours to pull that together. You can start, certainly start doing, like walking out of this workshop tonight, you could start pulling your finance proposal tonight together if you wanted to in terms of the front section, the applicant section, your suburb due diligence. You can certainly start pulling that together as soon as you completed step number two. And then really all you've got to do is just pull in the back end. So don't leave it right to the last moment. Get a start by, four, you know, these, these folders are $4 at Officeworks. Make a start on it right now. Don't. There's lots of stuff you can do working up from this workshop.